Time now to talk to the Foreign Minister about all of that. And to take us there, here is the British Prime Minister offering support for Australia's position on China. So uh, we stand shoulder to shoulder with our, with our friends. Uh, but I think I, 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 I probably speak for Scott as well when I say uh, nobody wants to descend into a new Cold War uh, with China. We don't see that as the, uh, that as the way forward. This is a, a, a difficult relationship uh, where it is vital uh, to engage uh, with China in as positive a way as we can. But where there are difficulties, which there evidently are, it's vital that allies... UK, Australia, work together, and that's one of the reasons why uh, we're sending the, you know, they're sending the carrier strike group out your way. Maurice Payne, welcome to the program. So, Good morning. how important are these statements uh, from some of the G7 leaders that we saw over the past week? Do they embolden the Australian government to take an even firmer line when it comes to China? Well, the Australian government will maintain our very clear and consistent line uh, on these issues uh, broadly. But importantly, I think what the G7 Plus meeting has shown and a number of our other engagements uh, is a, uh, a realisation that, that the issues around strategic competition, the issues that uh, we are facing in the Indo-Pacific are very real. Uh, the opportunity to meet in person, uh, notwithstanding the challenges of COVID, does make a substantial difference. I found that myself at the foreign ministers' meetings uh, in May and the prime ministers just had the same experience uh, as well. Not just, of course, in, uh, in London and uh, Cornwall, but through his visit to Singapore and his meetings in France. Uh, so whether it is the United Kingdom, whether it is the G7 itself, whether it's the United States uh, and, uh, the, and France as well in, in recent comments... Um, these acknowledgements of, uh, of the challenges of the geostrategic environment and particularly the position in which Australia finds itself are certainly welcome. We saw the, um, uh, the British Prime Minister Boris Johnson just in that clip there uh, refer to uh, sending a, a British carrier strike group uh, to the South China Sea and Australia's agreed to join in with some Navy vessels as well. What can you tell us here? What will they be doing and what's the significance of this? Well, we engage actually quite regularly with uh, partners uh, across the region and those who visit. So uh, a month ago, the uh, French sent uh, the Jeanne d'Arc task group uh, to, uh, to the region. We had uh, Australia, France, uh, the United States, Japan uh, working together. It in enhancing interoperability, enhancing that uh, development of familiarity, but also being very clear in our support of the uh, application of international law, whether that's through the UNCLOS, uh, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, or more broadly. Uh, and certainly we welcome uh, the engagement of uh, Her Majesty's ship Queen Elizabeth uh, and the vessels that will travel with her, and we look forward to doing that. We have had our own task groups, Indo-Pacific Endeavour, uh, travelling throughout the region annually since 2017 now, in the Pacific, in North Asia, in Southeast Asia, mm. uh, and across to uh, South Asia as well, affirming those bilateral defence relationships and those multilateral engagements. It's just that Boris Johnson said about this particular um, uh, exercise that it's because, quote, people are worried about what's happening to the Uyghurs, about the general repression of liberties in Hong Kong and some of the ways China behaves in the region, particularly towards Australia. Is, is that why we're joining this one or is it more routine, as you suggest? Uh, well, it is, it is routine, but uh, we are not, uh, uh, we're not denying the challenges of strategic uncertainty. And I think the G7 meeting affirming that, NATO's observations in the last mm. week, have been very important in demonstrating that there is a, a broad realisation across many partners uh, of the challenges that the strategic uncertainty poses for Australia uh, and more broadly. Uh, we've engaged previously with the UK when they've sent vessels uh, to the region. Uh, this, of course, is their new carrier, uh, HMS uh, Queen Elizabeth. It's a very significant uh, undertaking on their part, but we welcome it. We think it adds to interoperability, it adds to familiarity uh, and is, is something that uh, the Australian um, Defence Force and the Australian Government is very happy to support. But we're not doing this because of the way China treats its people, as, as Boris Johnson suggested. 
Uh, well, I think there's a range of issues uh, at play and certainly Australia has been very clear in our views on the human rights issues uh, in China, including, uh, as you've mentioned in passing, mm. uh, in relation to Xinjiang. A couple of other things. The, the push for uh, a, a second, a fresh inquiry into the origins of the coronavirus. Um, Dong Jingwei, China's Vice Minister of State Security, is reported to have defected to the United States and may have passed on intelligence relating to the origins of COVID. Are you aware of any of this or any new information that may suggest uh, how the, the, the pandemic began? Uh, well, I wouldn't normally comment on uh, intelligence matters uh, of that nature. But what is very important here is that we do maintain the momentum of this inquiry process. Uh, we know that the Phase 1 inquiry had uh, significant limitations in, t in terms of uh, the delay in uh, deploying it, uh, access to information, uh, access to uh, appropriate scientific and medical evidence. So we are very determined to work with our partners to ensure that the Phase 2 investigation uh, is able to uh, access the material that it needs, including within China. Uh, that is strongly supported by uh, the G7 itself, who has uh, ca canvassed this issue in their meetings. Uh, it's strongly supported by many of our other partners. And, uh, and I note uh, that uh, Ellen Clark and her colleague Ellen Sirleaf Johnson and their most recent report, uh, the Independent Panel on Pandemic Preparedness and Response, has also focused really importantly on the need for timely access and timely engagement. The most important thing here, David, absolutely is that this never, ever happens again. It doesn't matter whether it's from Australia's perspective, from the United States' perspective or the smallest developing nation. Mm. We all share that view. But, but, I mean, clearly, if any inquiry is going to get to the bottom of this, China needs to provide information and there's no indication they're going to give any more than they have. If they, if they don't, will Beijing be hiding the truth? Well, I'm not going to speculate uh, about whether they will or they won't because they are strongly encouraged by many, many parties. Uh, and those who sit around the World Health Assembly table are included in that. Uh, mm. To do so, to enable this to be uh, a very uh, clear and comprehensive process, that's something which we have been advocating for, as you well know, uh, and will continue to do so. On trade, Australia is now going to lodge a second case at the World Trade Organisation against China, this one over wine tariffs. Um, what's the point of doing this if the WTO is seen as a toothless tiger? The Prime Minister has been talking about the need to reform the organisation. What's the point of lodging a case at the moment? Uh, well, there's a number of, of factors here. Certainly, we believe that the World Trade Organisation needs a number of key reforms. Uh, both Dan Tian and I have met with the new Director General, uh, Dr Ngozi Okonjo Iwiala, in Geneva ourselves in person recently. Uh, but what lodging the dispute enables us to do is to begin uh, dispute settlement consultations. That actually is a uh, bilateral discussion with China about the issues. We've seen duties of over 200% applied to Australian wine. We don't believe that that is consistent with uh, China's uh, obligations uh, under the WTO. So that part of the process enables us to have that uh, direct conversation. And then secondly, in relation to the reform question, as I said, uh, we have been calling for some time for the reform of the appellate mechanism, a uh, dispute settlement system uh, reform as well to ensure that there are processes of transparency in place, all of those sorts of aspects, which the Prime Minister canvassed, in fact, in his speech in Perth before he travelled uh, to, uh, to Europe, uh, have been reinforced by his conversations and reinforced by my conversations with the Director General and those of Minister Tian. The uh, G7, in their communique, committed again to net zero emissions by 2050 and achieving an overwhelming decarbonised power system in the 2030s. Why can't Australia make either of those commitments? Uh, well, we're very focused, as, uh, as we have been clear, on low-cost, low-emissions technology. We signed three new partnerships during the Prime Minister's travel with Germany, with Japan and with Singapore. And the Prime Minister has been very consistent in saying that we absolutely want to aim to achieve net zero emissions, preferably by 2050, uh, and that remains our position. All of our achievements so far uh, have overachieved on our targets uh, and we intend to keep doing that. But what we have seen 
What we saw around the G7 table, what I saw in my travels in the United Kingdom and in the United States and the meetings that uh, took place there, uh, was a significant interest in Australia's focus on low emissions technology and the work that we are doing. All right. uh, just on the preferably by 2050 uh, position that, that you've used there as well, is that a government position? Is it something Cabinet's agreed to? Uh, well, I don't usually discuss uh, cabinet, discuss, okay. uh, cabinet matters, it is a government uh, as position. you know, but it is uh, the clear position that the Prime Minister has articulated. Is it the government's that we position? We want to make sure that we are uh, protecting Australia's industry, Australia's businesses, Australia's farmers, uh, and not doing this by taxes, but by technology, no, I know that line. and preferably by 2050. Sorry, Minister, and I know this is the Prime Minister's um, language, but is it the government's position? Uh, it is the, the broad position of the Australian Government that we want to achieve net zero emissions as soon as possible and preferably by 2050. It is a sensible position and we need to make sure that we do it not by penalising our mm. businesses, our farmers uh, and uh, producers through taxes, but an absolute focus on low emissions okay, sorry, technologies. Just and to that's be clear on this, just, I just want to be clear for the viewers on this, broadly the position of the Government. Does that mean it's, it's the Government's position? The Prime Minister has been very clear, David, that it is an, an objective of achieving net zero emissions as soon as possible and preferably by 2050. And that's the government's position? That is absolutely what the Prime Minister has said, David. OK. Well, just on uh, emissions, we know the Nationals have a somewhat different view. Uh, some openly oppose uh, any sort of target of net zero by 2050. What do you say to them as Foreign Minister about where that might leave Australia internationally, whether it's in relation to our Pacific neighbours, with Europe, with the Biden administration? Uh, well, I would uh, advocate and repeat what I've, uh, what I've said in the past, which is that we are uh, forming a pathway, building a pathway that takes us to a technology-driven, not tax-driven, a technology-driven solution in, in emissions reduction. Mm. We've seen it uh, benefit us in trade terms or in uh, partnership terms, I should say, with Germany, with Singapore, with Japan, just in the, uh, in the Prime Minister's visits now. No, That's I, obviously we've, we've heard, we've a heard positive that position. No, I'm sorry, reinforcement we across I, those relationships. I guess what I'm asking is, does it matter for Australia internationally, in your role, if we don't sign up to this target? How, how significant is it? Uh, well, these discussions always matter, and that's why the Prime Minister took uh, uh, his views and our views to the G7+. Plus. It's why I've engaged uh, in the United States, in the United Kingdom, and across the region, including, as you said, with the Pacific, where these mm. issues, through the Boy Declaration, through the Kanaki 2 Declaration, are recognised as key security challenges in the Pacific. Uh, we understand and have supported both of those declarations and work closely with our partners in the Pacific to address these okay, issues. OK, but what I'm asking is, would it matter if Australia does not sign up to this target? Would it matter to our relations internationally? Uh, well, Australia's been very clear in our approach internationally, and that is... Not on this target, uh, with objective... respect. Not, not about the net zero by 2050 target. Well, that is the question that you asked me. Yeah, and I'm just saying, does it matter if we don't sign up to that target? Well, we are absolutely on a path to doing that in terms of the work that we are doing through low emissions technologies, uh, through the work we are doing across the region in uh, supporting the development of climate resilient and climate adapted infrastructure, uh, particularly in the Pacific, but also a focus in mm. Southeast Asia. So we will uh, sign up to the target? we are doing in oceans and land. Well, David, we've, I've said clearly what the Prime Minister's undertaking is, and that is what we are committed to. OK, yeah, look, are you nervous at all about the prospect of the Nationals changing uh, leaders back to Barnaby Joyce? Well, these are matters for the National Party, David. I heard you say uh, early in your remarks uh, as the program started that uh, uh, Liberals and, frankly, anyone, any other party speculating on, uh, on the leadership processes of a, uh, of a coalition colleague or another party in the parliament is never helpful and I don't intend to contribute to that. Well, that's probably wise, but uh, you've sat around the Cabinet table with both Barnaby Joyce and Michael McCormack. How do they differ? I'm not going to make personal comments or observations on my parliamentary colleagues uh, and I'm not going to, uh, okay. to, in to uh, inject myself into the National Party's process. One thing the Nationals uh, were pretty excited about this week was the Prime Minister shifting on the idea of an agricultural visa. Uh, our Pacific neighbours, though, may not be as excited about the prospect of this. How will this work? Will it mean Pacific workers uh, are left out of, of jobs in Australia in favour of those from the Philippines, from Vietnam and so on? 
Uh, well, the first thing I can say is it absolutely will not mean that Pacific workers are left out. In fact, uh, we only last week announced a streamlining process to bring the Pacific Labor Scheme and the Seasonal Worker Program uh, into greater alignment, both for our Pacific sending countries and for uh, producers and, uh, and farmers here, uh, so that uh, renews our strong commitment to the, mm. uh, to the Pacific uh, Labor Scheme and the Seasonal Worker Programs, which draw from those Pacific neighbours. Uh, the agricultural visa more broadly uh, is something that the uh, government has committed to and will enable us to make sure that in terms of COVID recovery we have uh, the workers that we need and it particularly reflects uh, the change in the structure of the uh, of the working holiday maker visa as it was with the UK. Will there be the same conditions though for this new agricultural visa for the Southeast Asian workers as the Pacific workers will it or will it undercut the conditions that the Pacific workers have to get? Uh, well, the Immigration Minister, Alex Hawke, will lead that work as the visa process uh, is developed, but it will comply with uh, all the appropriate requirements for protection of workers uh, and protection of, uh, of employers, uh, as is currently the sorts of structures that you would expect to see. So same, same conditions, uh, same conditions as the Pacific workers? Well, the, uh, Minister Hawke will, will, will lead that work, as I said, mm. uh, and that is yet to be done. Because David Littleproud, your minister, is saying they'll be different conditions, there are special protections for Pacific workers. So this new visa for the Southeast Asian countries might be different. Uh, well, we would absolutely ensure that the appropriate legal requirements which uh, need to be in place to protect workers, to support employers, are in place, no matter what the sort of visa it is. Right. Uh, but the Pacific Labor Scheme, we have over 12,000 workers here now and a ready worker pool of 27,000 in the Pacific, and I look forward to uh, welcoming them to Australia as soon as conditions allow. They've been coming for some time now, and we hope and we know that that will continue. Just a final one. Uh, Sean Turnell, the Australian economist and former advisor to Aung San Suu Kyi, is He's expected to face trial this week. This is some four months after he was arrested in Myanmar um, in the days after the coup there. Do you know what's happening with this trial and have you spoken, been able to speak to your counterpart in Myanmar? The trial is uh, said to be occurring this week. Uh, our consular officials, uh, our post, uh, has been able to communicate with uh, Professor Turnell, uh, as has his family, and that is important consular access. Uh, I hope that the, uh, the process uh, is an, a, a, a fair and, and open trial. However, we do believe that Professor Turnell uh, is arbitrarily detained, and we have been consistently seeking his release uh, since he was detained uh, some months ago now. Uh, that is part of the advocacy that we have been supporting in relation to Myanmar more broadly. Uh, the Vice Chief of the Defence Force, uh, Vice Admiral David Johnson, spoke with the Deputy Commander-in-Chief to reinforce these points last week and uh, we've been very consistent in seeking his release. Foreign Minister Maurice Payne, thanks for joining us this morning. Thank you very much, David.